Well, welcome all uh, to this um, really great celebration. Um, I, I mean all, uh, but I want to make, before we do anything else, I want to extend a special welcome for reasons you will all appreciate now, but which will unfold as the evening goes on, and that's to Carol Holtzman, who was able to come down. Um, Judge Holtzman, our dear friend Howard, was unable to make the trip, but it's great to have uh, Carol, at least one half of, uh, of, of that pair. Um, this is a really exciting time at the American Society of International Law, as you will, those, many of you here are already very much involved and will appreciate how much is going on. Um, you know, we have our traditional activities. This year's annual meeting, I encourage you to look at the, the program that uh, Stonemir and Laurence and Caleb put together. It's probably as international representation as we have ever had, well befitting the theme of international law in a multipolar uh, uh, world. The mid-year meeting we just had was a great event. Uh, the, the, the idea of going outside of DC for the mid-year meetings, the, the idea of the research forum, which is instantaneously enormously popular, has been a wonderful addition to the ASIL annual agenda. Uh, we've just announced the formation of the ASIL forum, which is intended to be an umbrella coordinating committee for a lot of the activity that ASIL is already engaged in, in serving as, in effect, a neutral convener with credibility and authority uh, to tackle particularly difficult public um, policy issues that international law can make a contribution to. We are launching a new initiative to, to enhance our relationships with our colleague societies around the world, and that there will be a steering committee for that venture as well. We're at the midst of an, a hugely exciting trans transition at the American Journal of International Law. Bernie and Lori, having done spectacular work for a full decade, are now handing the reins to Jose and Benedict. And we're taking that occasion to convene a committee that will look at age governance and, and really solicit the views of age constituencies, its readers and the like, to see whether or not there should be some adjustments to the way age is governed and the way age relates to the society as a whole. And then perhaps most exciting at all, we're developing a new web, web platform which will be the basis for everything the society does, which will give us the tools to reach out to the global community of international lawyers and to enhance our mission to develop international law, discuss international law, debate international law, disseminate international law as a means of contributing to um, uh, international relations on the basis of, uh, of law and, and justice. Uh, and to do that, uh, we have launched, as many of you will know, the 21st century campaign. ASIL has reached the point in its life in which we can no longer rely on a steady stream of income from our publications, and we need to reach out for philanthropic support from our friends, from our committed supporters, from foundations, and the like who appreciate the value of what we do. Uh, that, uh, that campaign is well along. Um, we have the commitment from uh, a series of our, uh, of our, our most committed supporters, um, and that has been, includes a, a, a whole series of law firm and law school partners, George Washington, GW, uh, 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 the American University, uh, Georgetown University Law School, the American University Washington School of Law amongst the law schools, and then a whole host of law firm partners which have been uh, really important supporters uh, as we put together the law firm sponsorship uh, program. Arnold and Porter, Cleary Gottlieb, Devois and Plimpton, Freshfields, White and Case, Wilmer Hale, Sullivan and Cromwell, Covington and Burling, King and Spaulding, Sidley Austin, Steptoe and Johnson, Troutman Sanders. These are firms that have either supported us this year or already have signed up. Uh, where's Abby? Is she here? Abby Cohen-Smutney, who's vice chair of our development committee and who's, uh, who has been our liaison to the law firms, has done a, a wonderful job. And if you are a member of a law firm, beware. Uh, there may be discussions with you at the reception immediately after. We are in the process uh, of renewing our, our support and reaching out to potential new supporters. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a reflection of the confidence of the society that we really believe that the society brings real value to uh, law firms engaged in the practice of international, international law. Um, tonight, though, we have really special cause for celebration because, as you will know, this event and the preview we had last night at NYU is the formal launch of the Howard M. Holtzman Research Center on International Arbitration and Conciliation. Now, as I say, we've had real support from uh, some real friends 
of the society. Char Charlie Brower, always a leader, uh, made an initial gift that really made the whole campaign credible. Uh, many of us have, have made gifts um, that have been uh, intended to try to help us get to our eventual goal. But a few months ago, Howard, really in, in friendship to so many of the people who he uh, were, are dear to him and who are at the same time committed to the society, made a substantial gift uh, that really will make the possibility of reaching our goal realistic. Uh, and it really is, it made the whole campaign possible. It was on the basis of that gift that we announced our goal of $3 million, and we're getting close to that goal. What that gift will make possible is that, and the campaign as a whole will make possible, is the web platform I've just described, which will form the basis of all of the activities of the society. But one of the first activities that it will make possible is the Holtzman Center, uh, Research Center on International Arbitration and International Law. That's especially appropriate um, activity, uh, given Howard's long career, which Steve and, I, and Ugo will, I think, address a bit during their remarks. Um, as many of you will know, Howard was active early in the American Arbitration Association, really took, um, took the lead in its international activities, was one of the early leaders of the uh, International Council for Commercial Arbitration, ICA, um, was the US uh, representative on, the, on its UNCITRAL delegation for a very long time, played a key role in the development of the UNCITRAL model law and the UNCITRAL rules, um, where many of us, including myself, first knew him. He was a US member of the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal, uh, managed to write two very important treatises um, but in perhaps a, a contribution that we will focus on tonight and is a little bit less known, was instrumental in, uh, in reviving the Permanent, Court of International, uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration as a key player in the world of international dispute resolution. Um, so to celebrate, um, to take uh, advantage of the occasion of the new Secretary General of the PCA's visit to the U.S., uh, it seemed a perfectly appropriate way to launch the Holtzman Center, given that connection between Howard and the PCA. And so I'm very pleased to introduce Hugo Sobles, who's the 13th Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, a post that he's held since two, June 2012. Prior to assuming that position, Mr. Sobles served as Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to France, Monaco, and Andorra, and as the Director General for Political Affairs and Director of the Consular Department of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Sobles received his law degree from the Free University of Amsterdam, joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1973, and served in the office of the legal advisor for 10 years during the course of his career with the Netherlands government. So you'll see he's extremely well qualified to take on that position. Uh, it gives me also extraordinary pleasure to introduce, well, um, <laughs> the notion of introducing Steve Schwabel in this building is a little bit silly, so let me correct that word. It gives me enormous pleasure to have invited Steve and for Steve having agreed to provide comments uh, uh, on Ugo's remarks and also to help us celebrate Howard. I, I, needless to say, I don't need to tell the folks in this room about Steve's career as a <coughs> practitioner, as an academic, as a judge, as a, uh, in government and the like. Um, the two things, though, that w which we hold him especially dear, of course, his service as the U.S. member of the, as a member from the United States on the ICJ for a long period of time but also, of course, as in his early career, executive director of the, uh, of the American Society of International Law. I will add a personal note, if I may, um, because, of course, I began to do what I do uh, because I spent the year with Howard uh, after having clerked in the U.S. courts, went off to the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal, and like many, became involved in, in this universe. But within a couple of days, in fact, it may have been the, the day after I arrived on a Sunday morning, it may have been the the Monday that I started at work, the first thing that Howard did was march me off to Steve's offices, introduce me to Steve, <laughs> and probably two or three weeks later, uh, I had my first Thanksgiving outside the United States at Steve's home. Um, so those connections are long-standing and deep for me personally, but they are also there for the society. And as I say, I think you know, Howard's gift here, um, extraordinarily generous as it was, was really a gift to all his friends. Howard has been a member of the American Society for something like 40 years, but was not active in a lot of our, um, of our activities. But when he came to appreciate the campaign and came to appreciate how many people to whom he was devoted were deeply devoted to this society, he decided that this was a gift he would make 
in order to make real the possibility of the 21st century campaign. And we are in turn enormously <coughs> pleased to make one of the first activities on the basis of the platform that his gift will make possible, the establishment of the Howard M. Holtzman Research Center on International Arbitration and Conciliation. And you are all welcome, and we have a special welcome to Ugo and Steve, the, the Secretary General and our former Judge of, uh, President of the ICJ, to this, the first absolutely official event of the Holtzman <laughs> Center. So perhaps, um, this, Mr. Secretary General, you could start the activities uh, with, with, a, uh, with great uh, pleasure on our part. Well, um, thank you, thank you, Donald, for that introduction. Um, I hope to be able to live up to those uh, expectations, and I'm glad you introduced me as the new Secretary General, which allows me to hide behind uh, the adage that uh, that uh, uh, me as a diplomat, uh, and you know the definition of a diplomat, uh, he uh, who knows uh, a, a bit about many things, but very little about anything in particular, uh, that uh, I could uh, still hide behind. Uh, that qualification when uh, the time for putting uh, questions uh, to us uh, has, has arrived. Um, but then, um, I should be honest, I was uh, trained as a lawyer and uh, I started my career as, a, um, as an assistant legal advisor. And so I'm, I'm not too terrified when my staff says, uh, well, uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, prima facie, we believe that you have acted ultra virus. Uh, that's not something that really shocks me. <laughs> You've asked me to, um, to speak this evening on the role um, of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the field of international dispute resolution today. And I cannot think of a more fitting context in uh, which to address this topic than at the launch of a center dedicated to Howard Holtzman, um, one of the most important people in the revival of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. To put the current work of the PCA in context, I'd like to recall that the organization, I'd like to recall the organization as it existed in 1981, the year that Howard Holtzman arrived in The Hague to take up his, uh, his function as judge at the uh, Iran-US Claims Tribunal. And I speak from a personal experience because at the time I was an assistant legal advisor, as Donald has recalled at the Netherlands Foreign Ministry, and uh, was familiar uh, in that uh, role with the organizations, uh, international organizations operating in The Hague. The PCA, um, after having been established in 1899 and administering a number of significant arbitrations in the early decades of the previous century, uh, by 1981 had fallen upon hard times. Uh, the preceding uh, 40 years had seen only one arbitration brought to the PCA. And I'm, I think Michael Reisman is not here, but yesterday at the similar occasion in New York, he made the point that um, the PCA in fact was uh, partially uh, still in business uh, once the Permanent Court of International Justice had been created because some countries were holdouts, countries like the US uh, who would still need uh, the PCA because they were not bound under the statute of the uh, Permanent Court of International Justice. But the, uh, uh, only during those 40 years, only one arbitration was brought to the PCA. And the organization had been reduced to a small, and again, from personal experience, a very, very quiet corner of the Peace Palace. But the building, uh, in fact, the building of the Peace Palace with, was created with the uh, generous a gift of Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, Carnegie uh, that was meant uh, to, uh, to house and to, 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 ho to, to host the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, in the expectation that the Permanent Court of Arbitration would fill the building, and it didn't. And each year, the PCA member states deplored the lack of cases uh, uh, in the meetings of the administrative councils, uh, but cases did not come. Holtzman was familiar with the PCA even before his move to The Hague. In 1976, he represented the United States at the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, 
during the negotiations of the arbitration rules being prepared by that body. And in the last days of negotiations, Howard Holtzman, Peter Saunders, and other principal figures in the preparation of the UNCTRAL rules placed a call to the then Secretary General of the PCA, Baron van Boetselaar, in order to resolve a critical impasse that had emerged with the procedures for constituting a tribunal where a party or the party appointed members of a tribunal failed to make an appointment in accordance with the rules. They awakened the Baron, quite literally in the middle of the night, given the geographic position of New York uh, in comparison to The Hague. But the productive result of that call was the inclusion of the PCA Secretary General in the default mechanism for appointment under the rules. Since then, my predecessors have regularly acted to designate appointing authorities or directly uh, to appoint arbitrators in a wide variety of disputes involving parties from around the world. Judge Holtzman was reintroduced to the PCA only a short time later in 1981 with his appointment to the newly formed Iran-US Claims Tribunal. In the early days of the tribunal, the PCA acted to provide staff and space in the Peace Palace until separate premises could be completed elsewhere in The Hague and a secretariat assembled. In 1982, the then Secretary General of the PCA, Ambassador Varekamp, also acted to designate an appointing authority for the tribunal under a procedure adapted from the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. Over the years that followed, Howard Holtzman and the PCA came to be closely connected. He played a leading role in the preparation of modern arbitration rules for the PCA beginning in 1982 with the adoption of the PCA's optional rules for arbitrating disputes between two states, the first modernization of the PCA's rules for interstate arbitration since the 1907 Hague Convention itself. A year later, the Administrative Council adopted optional rules for disputes between a private party and a state, followed in 1996 with rules adapted to the specific context of international organizations. In each case, Howard Holtzman and the other working group members drew extensively on the UNCITRAL rules, with which Holtzman, of course, was closely familiar, yet did not hesitate to include significant changes where they considered modification necessary to reflect the prevalence of state parties in arbitration at the PCA or that the public nature of such disputes differed from the commercial context of the ancestral process. Judge Holtzman also brought to the PCA his experience with mass claims processes, a product of his service in the late 80, 90s as an arbitrator on the Claims Resolution Tribunal for Dormant Accounts in Switzerland. From the experience of that tribunal, Holtzman became convinced that the practice of mass claims tribunals was insufficiently examined and recorded. Too often, when world events led to the creation of new mass claims process, the valuable practical experience of prior tribunals had been lost and arbitration and their staffs were left to develop procedures afresh with far too much trial and error in handling very large numbers of claims. In answer to this problem, Holtzman brought to the PCA to bear, convening under its auspices a seminar on institutional and procedural aspects of mass claim settlement systems. Thereafter, a steering committee on international mass claims processes was formed with Judge Holtzman as its chair meeting regularly at the Peace Palace to examine the procedures and techniques employed by different mass claims tribunals. In 2007, the committee published, under Holtzman's editorship, a volume examining in extensive detail the experience of 10 different international mass claims processes. 
As important as these formal capacities, however, was Howard Holtzman's role as an advisor to the PCA, and particularly the close connection he developed with Hans Jonkman, the PCA Secretary General throughout the 90s and recently deceased, and himself a tireless contributor to the goal of reawakening the PCA. In helping to guide the PCA through the difficult process of re-establishing itself, Holtzman was able to draw on his experience with the American Arbitration Association and his familiarity with the day-to-day -day challenges confronting such an organization. Where then are we today? I am pleased to tell you that the long, strenuous and patient efforts of Holtzman and others have borne fruit. As of this moment, the PCA is acting to administer 71 pending cases, including five interstate arbitrations, 48 arbitrations on the bilateral or multilateral investment treaties, and 18 arbitration in contract disputes involving states, state entities, or international organizations. In total, 152 arbitrations have been brought to the PCA in the past 12 years, in comparison with only 34 cases administered in the first 100 years of the organization. In interstate arbitration, the PCA has recently seen more activity than at any other point in its history, including the flush of arbitration brought to the PCA in the early days before the First World War. And in disputes between states and private parties, the PCA has now handled more arbitration under the, arbit under the uncertural rules than any other institution, developing in the process a singular experience in the application of those rules. One of the questions posed by today's uh, event concerns the role of the PCA and its relevance as an actor in the field of international dispute settlement in comparison with other specialized institutions with overlapping jurisdictions. The easy answer, of course, is that the, the, the figures speak for themselves. A trend of growth that appears, if anything, to be accelerating. After all, the usefulness of any institution is determined by its users. And the caseload that I just described establishes that states quite clearly see a use for an organization with the capabilities of the PCA. But I do not wish to proffer uh, simply uh, statistics in response to a question that, of course, is more nuanced. What is interesting is not so much whether there is a demand for the PCA, because there is, but why? What is the PCA's specific contribution to the mechanism of Pacific settlement of international disputes? And on this question, I believe that a number of points bear noting. First, it is significant that the PCA is far from alone in seeing a substantial increase in activity and cases. Among other fora for the resolution of international disputes, the International Court of Justice continues to receive new cases at a steady rate and maintains a substantial docket even, if it's rent, if, even as it renders decisions more rapidly than ever. Here in Washington, the International for Set Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes has registered an average of 30 new cases over each of the last 10 years, more than triple the average of the preceding 10 years. And I note the presence of Mick Kinnear, uh, Secretary General of the exit in this room, so she may have more recent figures than I have the exit being a transparent institution that it is. No doubt the explosion of uh, bilateral investment treaties in the 90s explains much of this growth, uh, both for exit and the PCA. But data from the world of commercial arbitration show a similar trend. Institutions uh, such as the London Court of International Arbitration, the American Arbitration Association, and the International Chamber of Commerce have all experienced significant growth, much of it occurring in the last five to 10 years. In short, 
the expansion of arbitration at the PCA is not a shift from one organization to the other, but a phenomenon common to all institutions that reflect a global increase in recourse to dispute settlement. Second, in confronting a growing demand for dispute settlement, I believe that choice has a value of its own. In arbitration, party autonomy, in other words, choice, is of foundational importance. And this is not simply an abstract principle. Rather, it reflects the fact that while judges and arbitrators may better know the law, and while institutions may be experts in procedure, the parties themselves know their dispute and the particularities that stand in the way of its resolution. Party autonomy is not simply about exercising control over the choice of decision makers. It extends equally to the choice of forum or institution. And there is no disservice to any institution, including the PCA, in acknowledging that some particular international dispute may well be more effectively resolved elsewhere. Choice allows for competition, both in general and for arbitral institutions, and provides an incentive for all to put forward their best effort. Choice also provides the opportunity for innovation. International adjudication involves the delegation of significant power into the hands of a few individuals. Ensuring that such power will be wielded effectively is a never-ending process of correction and improvement, in which the comparative experience of other institutions and procedures may be invaluable. The PCA has recently completed a revision of its arbitration rules, building on Howard Holtzman's work in the 90s and culminating in the adoption in December of last year of a thoroughly updated set of rules, unified to work equally with any combination of parties that may appear in a PCA-administered arbitration, states, state entities or international organizations and private parties. Underpinning this process was a careful review of recent changes in the rules of other inst institutions, arbitral institutions, and the end result includes several innovations that bear noting tonight. Anyone active in international arbitration will be aware that the increasing cost of arbitration poses a major challenge. Now, we had a discussion uh, this afternoon at the State Department that confirmed that statement. This is in part, of course, the product of the growing recourse to arbitration, as a finite pool of the most experienced arbitrators is in ever greater demand. Nevertheless, the growing costs of arbitration do threaten to undermine its reputation as a rapid and cost-effective means to resolve international disputes. And this is of particular concern in the context of the PCA, where nearly all arbitrations involve at least one state and where such costs are paid for in large part from public funds. Against this trend, the 2012 PCA rules take a number of steps to control costs, including through provisions for the review of arbitrator fees that go well beyond the recent modification of the ancestral rules. Similarly, any student of public international law is aware that the compliance of states with, within the legal system is, is essentially a voluntary process, an obvious challenge in arbitral proceedings whose awards will likely leave at least one party less than fully happy. Unsurprisingly, questions about compliance and enforcement are among the most common received by the PCA. In the, 19, in the 1899 and the 1907 Hague Conventions, the founders of the PCA sought to address this concern with Article 22, Article 43 in the 1907 Convention, in which the contracting parties undertook after the completion of an arbitration to communicate to the PCA, and I quote, 
the laws, regulations, and documents eventually showing the execution of the awards given by the court, end of quotation. This obligation was little observed in practice throughout uh, the early years of the PCA. However, it formally applies only to arbitration uh, initiated under the conventions themselves, something that is rarely, if ever, the case for arbitrations brought to the PCA today. In preparing the 2012 uh, PCA rules, however, the PCA has given new life to an old idea and the obligations to report on the execution of the award now applies as Article 34.7 to the rules of the rules to any arbitration between states. And I want to note in this, at this evening uh, the uh, role of Judge uh, Swabel in that regard in recalling to us at an earlier occasion the need for uh, further attention to uh, compliance with awards rendered uh, in arbitrations, interstate arbitrations, uh, under the PCA uh, rules. And we are not yet at the end of that process, definitely. Innovations such as these are, of course, an ongoing process. Uh, with respect to the execution of interstate decisions, in particular, the PCA intends to further examine the ways in which compliance with awards may be ensured. But they well demonstrate the value of choice in dispute settlement and the creative process of multiple organizations putting forward their best ideas in the face of challenges that are common to all. As a final observation, I would like to return to Howard Holtzman and to a point he made in the course of remarks delivered on the 100th anniversary of the PCA in 1999. Speaking before the assembled members of the court, the roster of international arbitrators maintained uh, by the member states of the PCA pursuant to its founding conventions, he noted that the drafters of the 1899 convention had succeeded in neatly encapsulating nearly all aspects of what has since become the worldwide, quote, culture of international arbitration, end of quote. In the same spirit, the practices and principles developed in the Hague Conventions proved directly relevant to the evolution of international commercial arbitration. Similarly, the ancestral rules developed with a commercial context in mind have had a great impact on interstate arbitration at the PCA and on the evolution of the PCA's own rules. Dispute resolution in different fields are not separate phenomena, but processes that build on and gain from one another. To me, this cross-pollination demonstrates the value of an institution with a flexible jurisdiction such as the PCA and it's easy to assume that a specialized institution focused exclusively on disputes of a particular nature will necessarily bring greater expertise to the process of resolution. But international disputes are not easily separated into watertight containers, and neither are the means to address them. At the PCA, we daily benefit from the experience of a wide variety of different arbitrations. By avoiding specialization, the PCA is also able to freely adapt as the dispute resolution needs of the international community themselves evolve. Three examples emerge from the PCA's recent years. First, the PCA has come to administer a significant number of contractual disputes involving states or state entities many of them initiated under the ancestral rules. In much of the world, contractual disputes rather than treaty matters pose the most common and pressing concern for governments that regularly enter into contracts of enormous value. Yet there is at present no institution specializing specifically in commercial arbitration involving states. Second, the changing needs of the international community are apparent in the PCA's approach to transparency. 
public disclosure is the norm in interstate arbitration and quite rare in commercial disputes. While the appropriate degree of transparency in investment arbitration, in between, in a way, has been an ongoing subject of discussion at the meetings of UNCTRAL, most recently last week in New York. Standing in part in each of these worlds, the PCA's approach to transparency, to transparency is similarly mixed, able to ensure the maximum degree of disclosure that parties and tribunals may desire, including through media relations, webcasting, and public access to proceedings, or equally to maintain even the existence of an arbitration in the strictest confidence. And in fact, some 85% of the cases administered by the PCA come under that category. So don't consult our website to know what we're doing. Finally, in 2008 and 2009, in another a novel context, the PCA administered the Abidjan arbitration between the government of Sudan and the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, or army. This was an arbitration between a central government and an armed movement within its territory, resisting its authority a dispute outside the jurisdiction of any specialized institution, including the ICJ, yet urgently in need of resolution. The drafters of the 1899 convention were concerned with disputes between states and the creation of means for the peaceful settlement of those disputes. Today, most armed conflicts are of an internal character, taking place not between states, but within states. Is it conceivable that the international community is capable of creating means for the Pacific resolution of those disputes as well, and of drawing on established dispute resolution mechanisms in so doing? The drafters of the 1899 Convention had, of course, no notion that a state would ever deign to arbitrate with a movement seeking to secede including with military means, and even less so with a private commercial party. But by establishing a flexible institution, they created a PCA available to meet the dispute resolution needs of states as and how they develop. To close, I submit to you that the PCA is as viable and as needed today when it was conceived more than 100 years ago. Thanks in no small part to the contribution of Howard Holtzman. It provides, together with the other institutions now active in the field of international dispute settlement, a potent contribution to the range of diplomatic, institutional and legal tools available to practically address international disputes. And in a world in which international interactions and disputes continue to evolve at a ferocious pace, the flexible mandate given to the PCA in 1899 is one of its greatest advantages. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Judge Roybal? Well, Donald, friends, it's a great pleasure to be here and a privilege to comment on the most interesting and comprehensive talk that the distinguished Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration has just given. Uh, I have to say that I've never heard as full and able a description uh, of the uh, current work and indeed some of the history of the PCA as he just gave now. Uh, as he pointed out, the Permanent Court of Arbitration 
is the uh, oldest such institution in the world. It celebrated its foundation in 1999. Uh, and this year, there'll be a celebration of the inauguration of the Peace Palace, uh, which 100 years ago, a gift of Andrew Carnegie uh, brought into being. Alas, very shortly before the outbreak of the First World War, uh, which certainly was a profoundly disillusioning event to him and other exponents of international arbitration. And if international arbitration was thought by the peace movement of the 90s, speaking of the 1890s and the turn of the century, uh, as the way to avoid war, uh, that hope was clearly misplaced, as so dramatically demonstrated by two world wars and innumerable other lesser wars, including those to, of our, our very day today. And as a generalization, I think it's fair to say that international adjudication and arbitration don't tend to prevent war. On the contrary, peace and detente and good international relations or relatively good international relations, tend to produce international adjudication and arbitration. And in times of extremely high international tension, at least states are disinclined to arbitrate and adjudicate. Uh, in better times, uh, there's more of it. But nevertheless, all that said, the Secretary General has now rightly indicated that arbitration between states may have a role in preventing or ameliorating disputes that can threaten the peace, or certainly even situations of an intra-state nature, not considered in 1899 and 1907, uh, but endemic uh, in the world today. Though even there, that's a very difficult process. If one looks at what in many ways was the groundbreaking arbitration between the government of Sudan and the uh, Sudanese People's Liberation Army. It was an extraordinary experience done at a very accelerated pace because for reasons of the relations between the parties, they needed a decision and not much more than a year. Uh, and they each put an enormous effort into it. And it was a public hearing and hundreds of people journeyed from the Sudan in their robes to sit and listen to the oral argument, which was broadcast. And the tribunal earnestly tried not only to meet the time schedule, but more than that, to render an award, uh, which was correct on the law, and which was regarded by the arbitrators as being a viable disposition of that very difficult dispute. And both sides, immediately after the award was read out, applauded it and said they accepted it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, one side uh, has failed to implement the award uh, in flagrant and profoundly disappointing ways. Now one finds, too, in the history of the International Court of Justice that all judgments 
have not been accepted and implemented, though the, the, the enormous majority of them have, but there are four or five notable cases in which judgments uh, have not been implemented, and despite the possibility of recourse to the Security Council, implementation is not followed. So it's a somewhat ragged world, uh, no doubt about that. But what I think is today remarkable, there are floods of international litigation. There's more international litigation going on this year than in the whole history of mankind. And the flood shows no signs of abating. It, it continues to grow. I mean, the International Court of Justice, which had one active case when I joined it in 1981, and uh, one case which had recently been concluded, the hostages case, uh, now has about 15 cases going uh, and is working at a pace which was unheard of uh, 30 or 40 uh, years ago. Uh, interstate arbitration, which some wrote off with the foundation of the Permanent Court of International Justice and the International Court of Justice, uh, is alive and well. As the Secretary General indicated, the PCA currently is servicing five interstate disputes, and that's a considerable number after all. The number of states is some 200 at most, and only states may be parties to cases before the International Court of Justice uh, when you think that the International Court of Justice has a dozen or 15 cases and when you compare that to a national court, it sounds tiny. But if a national court only had 200 potential parties, uh, national courts wouldn't have thousands or millions of cases either. They too uh, would find 15 cases a, a considerable uh, number. Well, in that context, considering that there are 200 states, to have five interstate arbitrations uh, going at the moment uh, is quite a striking development uh, in the evolution of interstate uh, relations and, and uh, those disputes are important. Uh, one that will um, soon produce an award is between uh, Pakistan and India, whose relations have been notably difficult uh, ever since partition. Uh, but the World Bank uh, performed magnificently in bringing those two parties to conclude a treaty in 1960 governing the use of the waters of the Indus system of rivers. And that forward-looking and very important treaty contains a provision for arbitration, uh, which was invoked for the first time two years ago by Pakistan. Uh, and the parties quite naturally gravitated to the Permanent Court of Arbitration to administer uh, that arbitration. And I may say, having had the privilege of participating in several interstate arbitrations administered by the Permanent Court, that its staff does an absolutely surpassing job. Now, other institutions in the field, such as uh, ICSID and others that have been mentioned, uh, do splendid jobs as well. But I have to say that on the basis of my experience, I know of no institution that performs better uh, than the Permanent Court of Arbitration. It has built a staff of young attorneys, uh, really quite young, uh, coming straight from law school or having been out for three or four or five years, who are extraordinarily talented, and who under the direction of the Secretary General and his very able Deputy Secretary General, uh, um, Brooks Daly, uh, render marvelous service 
uh, to arbitral uh, tribunals, not simply of a routine nature, uh, but in thinking through uh, the problems that a case presents and in assisting uh, mightily uh, in the drafting of the resultant uh, awards. Uh, and that's not the only uh, uh, very important interstate case in the hands of the PCA. There, there are a couple of the um, UNCLOS uh, cases uh, going forward now, uh, also very consequential uh, cases. Now the PCA also has become very active uh, in the field of investment arbitration, not nearly as active as ICSID, of course, um, but it is a considerable player. Here, I have to say, unfortunately, there's been, in my view, a um, misperception in many areas of the international community about investment arbitration, and there's considerable criticism of it uh, as being um, uh, unfair uh, uh, to states. Uh, the problem with that criticism is that it's false. Uh, there's no objective truth in it. Uh, states have done extremely well uh, in interstate uh, arbitration. Uh, and I regard this criticism as not only ignorant, but in some respects even malevolent, and think that the international bar has to be more vigorous uh, in defending what is one of the most progressive uh, developments uh, in international affairs of recent decades, that is to say, uh, affording uh, corporations and occasionally individuals uh, access uh, to international adjudication, uh, which traditionally they were denied. They were left to a diplomatic intervention, which was irregular, uncertain, and generally uh, uh, ineffective. Now, that's not to say that, it, that investment arbitration is necessarily effective. We, we see it has problems, too. Uh, but nevertheless, it has very real uh, achievements, not least in the development of a body of law. Well, we've come here this evening not simply to salute the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which has had uh, great, great achievements, uh, actually from the beginning and even between the wars, once the Permanent Court of Arbitration was set up, as for example, in the Norwegian ship owner's claim, which was a very important adjudication against the United States in the early 1920s, which was argued by a young lawyer named Dean Acheson and led to his becoming a partner uh, at Covington and Burling. Um, well, and not only because of these achievements of the Permanent Court of Arbitration have we come together, but we also want to celebrate Harold Holtzman's contributions to that court, uh, which have been beautifully uh, summarized uh, by the Secretary General. Uh, it was to the great good luck and pleasure of my wife and myself and our daughters that when we came to The Hague in 1981, a few months later, Howard Holtzman and Carol Holtzman uh, arrived. Uh, they became, uh, in effect, um, uh, grandparents to our daughters uh, and were wonderful to them. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you how many dinners uh, I had with the Holtzmans, uh, including a great many in periods when uh, Carol was back in the United States and my wife was as well and Howard and I were two lonely bachelors and we took a, a certain comfort uh, in one another's company even though neither of us could discuss uh, the work of the particular tribunal 
in which we sat, but we had a great deal of fun together. Uh, Howard had an affinity towards the permanent court of arbitration, uh, like um, st uh, uh, steel scraps have to a magnet. I mean, he was uh, greatly attracted to it from the moment he set foot in The Hague, spent a lot of time there. He used to kid me endlessly that the world court was simply a tenant in the building and it was really built for the permanent court of arbitration. <laughs> Uh, and as the Secretary General has so well pointed out, I, uh, he made a significant contribution uh, to the renaissance uh, of uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in, it, in its rules uh, and in affording it the wisdom of his experience in international arbitration and in general encouragement. He became very close to uh, Hans Jungmann, who had the benefit of uh, extremely valuable assistance from a, a deputy, Betty Schiffman. Is Betty here tonight? Betty was with us last night. Ah, last night, I see. And um, uh, he was endlessly around the uh, Peace Palace. He, he, he knew all its law. Uh, he um, uh, was interested in the contents of the Peace Palace. You know, it's a huge building, some of it's beautiful, some of it's ugly, it's full of uh, funny things, gifts given by various governments, some of which are really quite striking, others of which less so. Uh, Howard was very familiar with all of that. Uh, and if I recall correctly, Howard, uh, Carol, he, he noticed once that the chair of the Government of the United States, each member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration has a chair in which its representative sits at the annual meeting uh, of the Administrative Council of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and its coat of arms is embroidered on that chair. Uh, don't tell Howard I've said this because he's modest about his uh, philanthropies, but at any rate, uh, noticing that the American chair was looking rather worn, uh, he arranged to have it uh, refurbished. Uh, well, that's one of the tangiest of his uh, innumerable contributions to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He and Peter Sanders, the grand old man of international arbitration, who in the conclusion of the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards, uh, had uh, the idea of having the Permanent Court of Arbitration named as the residual appointing authority. Uh, he and uh, Peter Sanders um, were two wise spirits uh, who encouraged uh, the renaissance uh, of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Uh, Peter passed away some months ago at the age uh, of 100. Uh, Howard uh, happily is with us, though he's not as well as we would like him to be. Uh, but for a very long life, uh, he was not only very well, uh, but a man of exceptional uh, vitality and acuity and meticulousness. Uh, Howard exemplifies uh, a virtue in a good lawyer which is taking care, being meticulous, getting the facts right, having things well organized. When Howard Holtzman organized a panel at ICA, it was perfection. I mean, he had every minute of it plotted out, uh, and any participant uh, had to take it very seriously. And one of my earliest recollections of Howard is at the Stockholm Meeting and did you not speak at that meeting? Don, not that was a bit before my time in, in Stockholm. That was very early. If I was there, I would have been a, a very young participant. <laughs> uh, yeah, my recollection was that you were there, but I may be confusing you with somebody else. But you, you were Howard's first clerk, were you not? I wasn't his first. I was an early clerk. An early clerk. At any rate, Howard was very proud of his clerks, and especially proud of Donald, and I have to say that I share his pride in 
uh, Donald's uh, distinguished career and the dynamism that he's now brought to the presidency of the American Society of International Law and how it had a flotilla uh, of able clerks, very able. I mean, these clerks often, like Donald, had been clerking at the Supreme Court of the United States, so they were uh, very uh, much top draw uh, and brought to the tribunal uh, a great level of talent. Uh, and Howard himself, uh, of course, took his work very seriously. Uh, if you read um, some of his, uh, any of his uh, opinions uh, in the Iran US claim to tribunal, and he wrote quite a number of separate and dissenting opinions, uh, you'll readily see what I mean. He, he is a master a craftsman uh, of the law and has many other great virtues, some of which I've alluded to tonight and some of which Donald has alluded to. And it's a particular pleasure that Carol is here. Uh, uh, Carol, as you can readily see, is a lovely darling and uh, was a great support. Uh, I have to say to my wife and me and our daughters and our ears in The Hague, but uh, to all of Howard's clerks and to his uh, career. Um, Edwin Williamson, uh, a great friend of many of us, and his wife have a um, puff, a sort of um, uh, throw away uh, on, the, on a sofa which says, um, Behind uh, every successful man is a slightly surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think this is uh, an amusing point in that. And uh, uh, I, I, Carol um, ha has played uh, a, a great role in the success uh, of Harold Holtzman uh, and uh, it's great uh, that an element of that very successful career has been uh, his generosity, setting up a chair of an international law at Yale Law School. He's a, a very dedicated uh, Yaley and very attached to that law school, and now his magnificent gift to the society. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's something to celebrate, and I'm very pleased to have been able to participate in the celebration. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, perhaps I should invite Garth Schofield, legal counsel to the Permanent Court, um, if he'd like to join in the event that um, anybody would like to ask about the current activities of the permanent court. Um, we'll take a couple. We don't. We still have a little bit of reception left, so I don't want to take up too much time. But anybody who have any questions for Judge Schwabel, the Secretary General, or Garth? Now that I've called him up here, someone's got to have a question for him. There you go, John. <laughs> I'm a pup ball, and I'm John Bellinger, a, a member of your court, along with Judge Schwabel. Uh, what? What, what, what are your goals going forward? I know you're relatively new on the job. I remember talking to Ambassador Croner when he took over. It seems like that was fairly recent. Uh, but uh, having looked this uh, court over, that seems to be being pretty successful right now, other than saying you'd like to get new business, uh, what, uh, what uh, problems have you identified? Uh, what goals uh, have you already set for yourself? Will I push a button here? It's on. It's on. Um, thanks for that question, which uh, uh, in fact allows me to uh, to make a point that I should have made in my in my intervention. Uh, that is that I uh, I, I believe the uh, the institution uh, that's called the Permanent Court of Arbitration owes uh, much, if not all, of its reputation to its very competent staff, uh, and uh, that, that is not to. Uh, not to be uh, negative about members of the court, but I think the uh, staff of the court is really uh, part of its, uh, it, it's its major asset, and uh, Judge Schwebel 
uh, rightly mentioned also in that connection the name of my deputy, Brooks Daly, who is uh, a very competent uh, deputy and a very, a very, uh, very uh, able um, uh, expert in, in anything related to uh, arbitration. So one of my, my main ambition is to maintain that quality of service uh, to arbitrators uh, and, and the parties uh, that are in, in disputes and, and seek uh, the PCA as uh, their forum for the settlement of their uh, dispute. Um, the other ambition is that um, we, I think we, we, I'm not sure whether we benefit from uh, the lack of visibility that the Permanent Court of Arbitration has or whether it's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a disadvantage. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of both uh, views and um, for some parties maybe the, um, the, the possibility to uh, deal with their issue in, in a confidential context is, 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 is a very welcome one. Uh, in other uh, disputes uh, transparency is I believe an important feature and so my second ambition if, uh, if you want to call it that way would be to, um, to put the PCA uh, and its potential more on the map. Thank you. Another question before we adjourn for the reception? Well, then let me um, take the opportunity, first of all, to thank Carol for coming down, to thank the Secretary General for affording us the opportunity to have this occasion on his visit to the United States, to thank Judge Schwabel for joining us um, for the reasons we've uh, suggested uh, the perfect person to help us celebrate Howard. And I want to thank all of you um, for helping us not only launch the Holtzman Center, but take the occasion to celebrate the extraordinary career of Howard Holtzman, the extraordinarily productive career of Howard, and in particular, his now generosity in establishing the Holtzman Center, which will allow us to continue to focus on, to develop, to increase the effectiveness of an institution, international arbitration, to which he was so devoted uh, and to which he made such an enormous contribution. So again, thanks Mr. Secretary General, Judge Schwabel, uh, and all of you. <laughs>